Welcome to the Bar Bend Podcast, where we talk to top athletes, coaches, influencers, and thinkers from around the world of strength sports. Presented by barbend.com. Today on the podcast, we're joined by multi time Olympian and Olympic bronze medalist Cheryl Hayworth. Today on the Bar Bend Podcast, I'm really excited to talk to one of my favorite people in strength sports and particularly in the sport of weightlifting, someone I've had the pleasure of working with multiple times over the last few years on color commentary in weightlifting, and that is none other than Cheryl Hayworth. Cheryl, thank you so much for joining us today. David, thank you so much for having me. What an honor, and I'm so excited now because uh, I I and uh, – well, Chad's been in the game, Chad Vaughn, for a while, but – Myself, uh, personally, I'm very new to podcasting, and I know it's a bit of an endeavor. This is brand new, and you're one of my favorite people as well, David, and always good for the pep talk and the quick boost to the ego, and I'm super stoked, and you know I love people like that. I'm super stoked to chat with you today, man. Thank you for inviting me. It's, it's really an honor. Yeah, I always have to pinch myself a little bit because I remember back when I was learning uh, learning about the sport of weightlifting and beginning to learn the movements, learn the snatch, the clean and jerk. Um, my coaches would always, when it when it came to the jerk, which was always my my weakest modality, my coaches would always say, hey, go find videos of Cheryl Hayworth. This was back in the early days of YouTube, not to date myself too much. They're like, go, go, go <laughs> I find. I was thinking, I'm like, there was a video of me somewhere jerking. Me. Go. This, uh, this was has been a couple of years. Go, for, you know, it was people uploading stuff that had been like ripped four times from different from like VHS <laughs> or what. You know, and I'm not not that not that old, but uh, and uh, there's oh go, yeah, some some of those videos are dusty. It's okay. They were like, go watch, go watch her jerk and just do that. And I was like, well, I I did, and I and I watched, and I was like, that's that's great. I can't do that, but I'll but I'll <laughs> attempt to. And now, uh, you know, a, a decade or more later, uh, being able to to chat with you, to work with you at USA Weightlifting events and that, and international events too, is a is a real treat. So, just as a little background for folks who might not be familiar with your weightlifting career, you're probably better known as a weightlifting coach and a broadcaster today. Um, but you know, how long have you been in the sport? How did you get started? And what are some of those? those highlight accomplishments in that very long resume. Wow, David, I don't think I've ever been called a broadcaster. You you, you, ha- you have day. It made me sound like so important. You're a guest on this podcast. You have your own <laughs> podcast and you do color commentary at international weightlifting events. I think I think that qualifies. I guess so. I feel like I need to call my mom straight away and tell her, guess what, mom? I'm a broadcaster. Somebody else said it. It wasn't my word. <laughs> he uh, said so that. that she, so that she can be proud. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, well, thanks for that. And I, you know, I had, uh, I had a really sort of, it wasn't the longest career. Uh, I think one of my biggest regrets is, is not having the longevity I feel like I should have, but you know, I packed a lot of stuff in there. I was a junior weightlifter and uh, at a high level and a senior weightlifter at a high level. So I had the chance to really compete all the time and snag some, uh, you know, because of course the first Olympics uh, where ladies were allowed to compete was in 2000. And I had stepped into weightlifting back in 1996 in Savannah, Georgia, the Anderson Cohen weightlifting facility down there. Um, to cross train for softball uh, as a 13 year old, you know, kind of, it was softball season. It's the summertime. My, my folks preferred us out of the house and we were very physical all the time. And, uh, you know, one thing led to another. I walked into the weightlifting gym and I knew I was a strong kid, you know, and so I, I very, very quickly, I think it was the first week they were like, yeah, uh, please keep coming in and lifting weights. And at that time, there was such a great group um, of lifters there, similar age. And I just immediately began qualifying for, for events and kind of climbing, climbing that ladder, um, one event at a time, qualifying for junior worlds one year before I was too, or old enough to compete, um, qualifying for the senior worlds the next year, also being a year, uh, too young to compete. And uh, kind of just always chomping at the bit, ready for my opportunity for the international stage. Um, won junior national. I don't know how many times I won junior nationals, but I think I still have all the school age and junior uh, national uh, records. 
Um, I was credited with a world record because uh, qualifying for the Olympics in 2000, going to that competition, obviously the first year women's weightlifting was at, at the Olympics in Sydney, Australia. Well, while I was there, uh, I managed to get the bronze medal. And also my last snatch um, when they created the youth world category, uh, so somebody, again, dusted off a lot of old um results and determine that that that's still presently um the most any woman 17 or younger has ever snatched so and it was 125 kilos so to give some context on that okay so we 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 went through four years of weightlifting really quickly there you started in 96 women are allowed yeah to- i was all over the place <laughs> in that uh and i'm sorry that was not no, linear at all it's it's great though because for context i mean you went from beginning in the sport as a 13 year old as a young teenager to being at the top level and getting a bronze medal when you were 17 at the first ever olympics where women could compete in weightlifting you're 17 years old you're on a new a, a new continent i don't know if that was your, your first time ever in australia um, it was actually my second time. I had I had competed at the Testament. They had had uh, just the few months prior. Oh, so that was it was fine. You were a, you were a grizzled seventeen year old at that point. <laughs> yeah, I had been some places. I I think my first international trip. I I was fourteen, and uh, it was the Copa Guatemala in Guatemala City, Guatemala. And I remember Danny Camargo was on that team. Uh, this is back in the day, right? And. Uh, yeah, so my my first international trip, we you know it wasn't far away from home, but it was far away from home. Right, uh, Guatemala City was a very interesting place to be as a, a very young person, and Junior Worlds was in Sofia, Bulgaria, the next year. Um, yeah, and 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 honestly, that I think more than anything, David, that plus the company that I kept, the people that I trained with, I had Kara Heads Slaughter moving to Savannah shortly after I began weightlifting. She almost immediately became my training partner. Uh, But these were the things that really kept me interested in in weightlifting Mm -hmm. and very, very intrigued. And I just happened to be really, really good at it. But um, sorry, I think I might have interrupted you with more storytelling. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to say I find it really interesting. So you, you lift in Sydney, you get the bronze medal. Your third snatch is 125 kilos. It's not a record... At, it's not a world record at the time, but then I, I think it was 17 years later, around 2017, around when we started right. working together, they dusted off these old records. Um, you know, they were redoing body weight categories. They were basically rewriting the record books, you know, literally, and they were trying to establish the youth world record in your body weight category. And they had to go all the way back to your performance at the Olympics to establish, well, you know that was the record, and and no one, no woman that age or younger has lifted more since then. So on the international stage, so Cheryl Hayworth, congrats! You're a world record holder. You know, just <laughs> casually, seventeen years after you performed the lift. Oh, that's that's okay. It's quite all right. I mean, at the time, it was an important lift. I don't think there was any additional incentive that could have been added. You know what I mean? Like youth world record would have been at the bottom of priorities, you know, reasons to make that lift at the time. Um, it was, uh, it was a five kilo PR. Cause I remember at the Olympic trials in new Orleans, Louisiana, uh, I clerked 122.5 kilos and, and we and- were only going by 2.5 kilos. Those were the only jumps that you could make. So I went from 120 kilos to 125 kilos and was just praying to God that, uh, and I remember it just ended up over my head and it was, uh, it was a good lift because we knew I, I probably needed that in order to set myself up. Cause my clean and jerk wasn't very big at that time. Uh, I didn't snatch too much more than that. Um, you know, ever, uh, which is quite sad in a lot of ways, but, um, I added about, uh, 16 kilos to my clean and jerk because it, it really, I, I ended up with a lot of, uh, efficiency just naturally moved really well with barbell. Um, really mobile. I was mobile even for a 13 year old girl. And, uh, so my strength really took a long time. I wasn't one of those kids that, I mean, I was strong certainly, but I, I, it took me a long time to get a big squat, to get a big clean and jerk. Um, and cleans are my nemesis. You know, if, if, if cleans were a person and walked in 
to my living room right now, I'd just punch it in the face. I'd be like, <laughs> you jerk, get out of here. Nobody invited you here. I, uh, Go away. I remember asking you once how many, uh, how many jerks you had missed in competition. And I think you, in international competition, you said one and it was on purpose. Uh, and I asked you how many cleans you had missed and you said, well... You know, how long do you have? How long do you have to chat about this? <laughs> oh, oh, many, many, many cleats. <laughs> now, I missed one jerk. It was a Pan Am championship, I think. And we were in the States and I missed it. And it was it was somewhat heavy. And something weird happened. And that was uh, completely accidental. And then we went up and it was fine. I still don't understand how I missed that jerk. If somebody has a video, please send, send it to me. But um, there were there were more than there was more than one jerk that I did miss intentionally at a national championship, which is sort of another long story. Um, uh, different times in USA weightlifting and, and things like that. But uh, it cleans, yeah, by far. Uh, and it and it depended. It, it, you know, I, I explain to my athletes all the time that you're going to go through phases where you're in love with the snatches. And you hate the clean and jerks and then you get strong and clean and jerks feel okay. And your timing is off or you're a little bit tired and snatches go completely to crap. Mm -hmm. So it really, you know, it depends on what, what part of the training cycle you caught me in. Yeah. Um, and we, but yeah, I, I had a strength problem for sure. Weightlifting is never a sport where uh, if you're someone who really likes to be completely satisfied and at peace with yourself, Maybe consider a different oh, yeah. sport because you're never yeah. gonna, you're never going to find that with weight, no matter what level yeah. you're at. And yeah, you you can't reach perfection ever. I mean, everybody has a point at which they fail in their technique. It's just how heavy does the barbell get mm -hmm. yeah. uh, before that happens? You know, so uh, you you never put it on cruise control, and you're always, always, always. And then sometimes those adjustments that you make at a certain level are going to be so minute that a lot of people aren't going to notice. And I point out changes in my own technique. Uh, when I watch video of myself lifting really at any type, because I haven't lifted competitively. I don't think since I retired, um, in 20, 2010, I think my last competition might've been the Olympics as a matter of fact, in, in uh, 2008, but my technique is, is so much different when I train now, even though, yes, it was efficient. Yes. Um, you know, I, I moved well most of the time. Uh, there's so many flaws in it that I see now as a coach and it's, and it's so rewarding for me to go ahead and as a coach now, and I never really enjoyed weightlifting as much, David, like it was kind of, I like the travel. I like the company that I kept. Um, training and stuff uh i needed Kara in there with me man mm. like if she wasn't there keeping me on track I, I probably wouldn't have made that olympic team initially or she really taught me um what she could about discipline and being accountable in the gym but i really didn't enjoy weightlifting until i started coaching it yeah. well, until I, mean, I started explaining it to people and realizing and appreciating how complicated it is and how really kind of cool it is and also stepping back and going, man, how did I get so good at this? This is so complicated, you know, and, and I've forgotten what it's like to learn the movements, but I also know what's a waste of time in, you know, based on my practical experience and what's not. So, so it's really satisfying for me to kind of solve those mysteries and talking about the jerk, you know, like you said, David, I think it's, there are some fundamentals that I know which work. Uh, and I can go ahead and just kind of clear the air and lay them out for people and, and maybe just make it a little less complicated. You know, it's, it's interesting. I, I was always told and, and Dennis Reno was my coach for a period of time and he's a, a story Love name and, and, you know, he, you still see him Dennis is, he's almost 80 years old. He might be over 80 years old and you still see him announcing at USA weightlifting events. He's just one of these people who's been around forever and he's seen the sport evolve really since, you know, since the fifties, if not earlier. And, yeah. uh, and Dennis always said, you know, the weightlifter's job is to not think the coach's job is to be their brain. And, you know, right. some, sometimes when I've talked to a lot of elite athletes across strength sports and, and they, they say the same thing. They're like, you know, when I was an elite lifter, I didn't, 
I didn't always have the most fun. I didn't enjoy the training. It felt like work. And and to be fair, that's that's their job. They're professional athletes. And they're like, I really started enjoying it when I became a coach. And I think those people just tend to be a little bit more cerebral. They like using their brains because when you're an athlete, you have to rely more on your training, that repetition, that right. muscle memory. You have to trust that all those hours you put in the gym will will pay off. And when you're on stage, you, you can't really do that much that much thinking. It's only going to get in your way. When you're a coach, you're oh, always yeah. thinking. You're thinking of every scenario. You're doing the cards in the back. You're trying to make sure your athlete is taking the right attempts. You're trying to pay attention to the other athletes. It's it's more like a game. It's more like chess. Whereas when you're the athlete, you feel kind of more more like a like a pack animal. You're like, well, I'm there. I lift the weight. I step off the stage. Right. And then if I if they and tell me to go important. back on, yeah. And that those uh, wiser words have never been spoken um, from my my friend Dennis Reno, who again, like you said, has just seen and experienced so many weightlifters in his time at all skill levels. And a coach, and the and you say the evolution of weight, weightlifting was a very different sport in the fifties than it is now. Um, it was it's a it's a little bit different than when I was a competitive weightlifter, and I, it hasn't been that long. Yeah, um, yeah. It's but you're absolutely right. You know, and and being coachable too. Being coachable, you can be so so talented. Uh, and I like to think that I was coachable and I think most of my coaches will agree. Now I could get a little diva in that, you know, uh, I get a little lazy about going into the gym and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I, I didn't enjoy the training, but you know what, when I was there, I gave a hundred percent. My coaches gave me feedback. I, I didn't argue with anybody. And when we were in a competition, it was, you tell me what to do. Mm-hmm. Don't ask me. I don't, I would get irritated sometimes when, because every once in a while you'll have a head coach who's, who's not your personal coach and just hasn't worked with you as much. And I wouldn't, when I say irritated, I say extremely mildly, you know, it, it just would kind of throw me off when they would approach and go, all right, what do you, what do you think you can do? And you're, I'm, and you know, and I would just, my response would always be the same. You tell me what I need to do. What do I need to do mm-hmm. to make whatever you've, you know, do I need a medal? Am I going for play? You figure that out and you just put it on the bar and I'm going to go do it because I don't want to have to do that. You I don't want to have to dedicate any more of my brain to make it other than, you know, making this next lift, period. You see very few coaches, especially at the international level. I've, I've noticed very few coaches asking their lifters opinion. Um, yeah, it's weird. It's, it's rare. Weird. And it's only happened once or twice. And I, I was like, wait, what? No, just go, just tell me what to do, man. Um, so that's all fantastic background on on your career. And I do want to emphasize, you said earlier in a recording at the very beginning that you, you wish you'd had a little more longevity in the sport. And fair enough, but not to undersell the longevity you did have. So you started competing. You started weightlifting in 1996. You were an Olympian in 2000. You were also an Olympian in 2004. You were an Olympian again in 2008, which was your last Olympics. And I, th- I think you're probably your, your, one of your final international competitions. During that time yeah. frame, you won 11 straight national titles in the women's super heavyweight category. Um, so all that to say, I mean, you were the best in your weight class in the United States for, I, I would argue, at least 11 years, probably a little bit more. That's still a pretty long run. Now, you started when you were super young, um, but right. that, that, that's over a decade of dominance in the sport in in your country. I'd say that's a that's a pretty good run for for most sports, especially most sports. <laughs> any any sport that was like you would call very physical um, or like right. taking a, a a a toll on the body. You know what I mean? This isn't. Uh, you see golfers who can compete into their fifties. You don't see a lot of weightlifters doing that. You know what I mean? Right. Or at least competing right. and, against you know, everyone. You're right. Yeah. And, and that perspective in, um, you're right. I mean, in 11 times in a row, like I blew my elbow out, uh, in 2003 at the junior worlds and that was my last junior worlds. And it would have been my third junior world championship that I won in a row. Um, and I'm not sure somebody once told me and I, it could be wrong, but somebody, uh, and I remember it was somebody who I remember thinking would know, um, it was the first time anybody had won the junior worlds three times in a row. And I was like, Oh, sweet. And again, that's anecdotal. It could be completely not true. 
Um, I know it's not true now because right. uh, Team USA, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I tearing it up. So uh, just, I love seeing that, by the way. Just for, for folks who aren't quite sure, uh, yeah, I'm not sure who the first person to win three junior world championships in a row was. We do know the first person to win four in a row, and that was that is CJ Cummings, who just had his who just had his yeah. fourth junior world title in a row just a couple weeks ago. Uh, we're recording this podcast. This might come out, you know, when this comes out, it might be a month or so after CJ did that, but he's the first from any country to pull that off. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And I remember being taken aback when that person mentioned that to me, I just had assumed that, uh, somebody had already done that, you know? Um, but it, it was so, yeah, at that competition though, I was 10 kilos ahead, um, in the snatch. I had just broken the American record at the, the national championships just a couple weeks before, with 128 kilos and my elbow was irritated and it usually get, got irritated after heavy snatches. Well, what happened was between the national championships, the way it was on the calendar, because remember I competed, I would compete at junior nationals, uh, senior nationals, junior worlds and senior worlds. So it wasn't just the national championships, the Pan Ams and the world championships. It was all that plus junior nationals and, and junior world championships, which I was expected to at least somewhat peak at, especially the junior worlds. So my elbow was a little achy, but I only had two weeks. So I, I, I continued building and getting stronger and stronger. And I felt great. My legs are strong. And I knew I was going to snatch a lot of weight. And my last attempt was 130 kilos and I snatched it. Um, and on the way up, I took a step forward and blew my elbow out. And uh, I tore the radial collateral ligaments off the bone, ulnar collateral ligament in half. Like I really, really just shredded my elbow, but I had a really wonderful surgeon, Dr. Um, Jim Andrews, who at the time was in Birmingham, Alabama. He may still be there, but he, he did like, um, uh, Roger Clemens elbow and, you know, John Elway and he's the elbow guy. So he fixed me right up and I managed to, I guess, because I could squat. And again, remember, David, um, it very, it's very true that my legs were really uh, in overall strength was what I had to work on. So even with the elbow injury, I was able to squat, keep my legs strong. So the very next year I was able to, because it was 2003, so I had to skip the Pan Am games that year. And I had to skip the world championships that year. So I wasn't able to help Team USA qualify for spots. We only had two spots for the Olympics the next year in 2004. Uh, but because I was able to keep my legs nice and strong, I was able to win the national championships uh, less than a year later after blowing it out and also uh, managing to qualify for that for that spot on the Olympic team. Um, but a lot happened in 2003 and 2004. So that 11 uh, consecutive national championships and, and being able to qualify for the Olympics in 2004, that was all pretty up in the yeah. air there for a while. It was touch and go. Um, but well, it, it was, it was tricky. It was, it's, it's fantastic to hear you coming back from that injury. Obviously James Andrews is maybe the most famous orthopedic surgeon in the world. Um, just with, Oh yeah, he was incredible. The number of folks he's, he's worked on. And I didn't realize he's the one who had done that surgery. I knew you'd had that injury. So I can add you to, to the, the laundry list of athletes. He's, he's helped get back, back on the mound. And you know, he platform. told me, he told me too, David, which is pretty cool. Um, because you are so familiar with him. He, he, cause he hadn't worked. Uh, now he did do some surgery on some, some other weightlifters subsequent to that, um, based on, you know, my recommendation, but he, he said, you know, I, I'm not so sure if you'll ever straighten it out all the way, you know, just, just real doctor talk here. Uh, cause you messed it up pretty good. And he said, he'd only seen that thorough of an elbow blow out a handful of times. And one particular time came to mind. He said it was because a bull rider, had strapped his hand to the bull, got thrown, and his hand didn't come unstrapped. So he got thrown, and uh, his arm remained attached to the bull, and he messed his elbow up similar to the way I did. And I was like, no, it, and it wasn't even particularly that violent. Well, you know, it, I dislocated it, and then I think I accidentally popped it back in when I grabbed it. And, um, 
you know, so it wasn't it wasn't too gross, but I really I did a number on it. Well, I but mean, he he fixed it right up. The the snatch is always it always did remind me of bull riding because you kind of have to pull and pray at at a certain point. You kind of yeah, pretty much yeah. <laughs> you know, there's a certain point where you just have to to let a higher power take the wheel, whether you believe in that or not. So um, exactly, and good thing I was on. It's 130 kilos and not so much what a bull weighs, but that's enough. It's a little tiny bull, but that's bull enough for me. I hey, guess. It, it was a, it was a calf, but it it was it was 130 <laughs> kilo bull. Yeah, was yeah, that's all damage. I can handle. <laughs> um, so what you know, I, I want to talk about two more things during during this uh, recording, Cheryl and. The first thing I really want to talk about is your transition and then just in general, your tips uh, for transitioning from uh, a career as an elite athlete to a career in the coaching sphere. You're someone who um, I think has, has really made that transition very well. And I know it's it's been a transition that has not been without its ups and downs. Um, you know, you have to move from taking care of yourself as an athlete to managing many athletes at once and leaving an impact there. Being a grown up. Yeah. yeah be, <laughs> being, being an adult. Um, and you know, it, it's true really as you transitioned from being an athlete to a coach that was very, that was at, at a point, um, in your life. And that's kind of at the age to where everyone has to start, you know, defining their career, kind of figuring things out as an independent adult. So, you know, what are some tips you would give to people, uh, to athletes who, or maybe wrapping up their careers and uh, maybe considering moving into the coaching sphere? That's an excellent question because I, I grappled with it for a long, long time in Kara Head Slaughter coming to the rescue yet again and also still my dear, dear friend. I was toying with the idea because uh, I got a, a BFA in historic preservation and it's a really cool field has nothing to do, uh, you know, with, with anything, uh, sports related, of course. And, um, I was thinking about getting a graduate degree and kind of just going into academia, seeing what was going on in art and design. So I recruited for my alma mater for a while and, um, and just kind of, and I enjoyed it a lot. I really did. Uh, but I, it, it just, I didn't see myself working in higher education as a career. And I was talking to Kara and she was like, you know what people, because I wanted to go back to school. And she said, people go back to school to acquire a base of knowledge. You have such an incredible base of knowledge. And she was explaining to me that she sort of felt the same way. And, and Kara is very, very cerebral and um, really enjoys studying and being a student and learning. And she was, she was doing a lot of uh, school stuff as well. And, but then she realized the value that she already had. Mm -hmm. Um, and it kind of, it made me think about it in a different way. And, uh, then I ended up having to move to Hong Kong, um, several years back in, in 2015, I was there for about three years. Uh, and I, it was essentially out of necessity that I began uh, weightlifting coaching because there were very few coaches there at the time, crossed it really so starting to gain momentum and people kind of looking outward for those specialists. And uh, I kind of um, dropped in their lap essentially because this one particular gym with competitive crossfitters was like, Oh my gosh, we were looking for a coach. So I kind of got put in a position straight away and, uh, and I'm very, very grateful to the folks I worked with in Hong Kong, uh, Ed Haynes, Coastal Fitness. Uh, we did a lot of professional development. I knew nothing about programming because, again, as an athlete, I ignored that whole bit. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? You, I wasn't involved in my programming. When I walked in the gym, my coach said, you got snatches today, triples. I wouldn't say, oh, but we did snatches yesterday for triples. I just started doing snatches for triples. Right. You know right. what I mean? Like I wasn't concerned with now, if I was tired, I would let somebody know. Um, you know, I was very in tune with my body and I knew, I knew when I was going to hit the wall. So other than that kind of feedback, that was that. So, so learning about all these different things that I was unaware of programming and, you know, when, when to give an athlete rest and, and how to program for CrossFit and cross training and people who come in who are, uh, competitive judo players who say, Hey, teach me the Olympic lifts. I want to get stronger 
at this or cross train for anything and just general fitness and strength training. So I was able to, to gather that sort of uh, base and apply it uh, and or um, not apply. Sorry, that's not the word I'm looking for. Um, implement it with the base of knowledge I already had. Mm-hmm. And uh, people in Hong Kong, I don't know if you know, um, you know, they're, they're very, very type A. These are, these are international business professionals, white collar. They want the best people working with them and they expect you to know what you're doing because uh, they're paying you a lot of money to do it. Right. And so they held me to a high standard. And um, I, that was that was a critical step in my development as a coach. Now being here in the United States, um, I think that, again, it, you need to be willing to learn, I think, as a coach, no matter what your credentials say as an athlete. Um I always was very aware and still am aware that just because I was good at weightlifting on paper does not, if I can't be, if I can't put my, myself and my athletes weightlifting shoes, if I'm not, if they make a funny face in the gym, David, I'm like, what, what was that? How's your shoulder? What was that? No, I saw that face. I saw those, those eyebrows don't furrow like that every day. What just happened? You're just like, you know you're constantly I mean? so, watching with eyes in the back of your head. Right. And I can feel when they get out of position. I was explaining to somebody the other day, I'm like, yo, when you come off the floor and you shift your toes and you still try to make that clean, I know what that feels like. Mm-hmm. And you just, you just wasted at least 75% of your strength just trying to save that lift. And that's um, uh, that's what really, really great coaching. I think we're at a point in, at least in, in the United States, in the weightlifting community, where you do see these coaches that combine these fantastic paper resumes. You know, I mean, your resumes, it's on paper, but also, you know, you can show them the piece of hardware. They combine that fantastic experience with putting in the reps and putting in the years, learning how to become a coach, not just immediately being like, I know how to coach, but right. finding those coaching mentors, putting in those reps, building that coaching experience. I mean, you mentioned Danny Camargo earlier in the broadcast. Oh yeah. As, as someone who was a teammate of yours. Now he's got one of the biggest weightlifting programs in the United States and it didn't yep. happen overnight. And people oh, didn't, no. yeah. people didn't start seeing That's him a as point. a, yeah, they didn't start seeing him as a coaching authority the minute he retired from being an athlete and became a coach, right? He, you know, he had a whole other career as a police officer as well as he built yep. his reputation as a coach. So, you know, it is nice to get your, you mentioned it's, it's cool. It's, it's nice to have that paper resume. It's nice to kind of get your foot in the door with your accomplishments as an athlete. That only gets you like one step in the door. Yeah, it does. It does. It gets you a little credibility because you know, you can't, you can't, I, I don't want to say can't, I'm sure it's possible that you can go through three Olympics and that mean world championships and, and high pressure situations and not have anything interesting to say or useful to say to another athlete. I'm sure it's possible, but it, it's really hard, you know? So, so I think people know that you have something that you can contribute and lend um, to the development of another athlete who's unexperienced, but it really, it really does matter how well, you know, the fundamentals um, in the why, So when I'm trying to figure things out, as long as I know why something happens, then I'm, you you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then you can apply if if you have an understanding of logic and how it works. If you have the fundamentals, you can then start filling in the blanks. You know, if this is true, then this must also be true. Um, If, if we're to believe that, uh, you know, logic and reason apply. Uh, So, so I think, and again, you can, things do get complex very, very quickly. And we have a variety of varying techniques and controversies. And, but then as an experienced weightlifter, putting in so many repetitions and uh, just understanding how it felt and what I know to be effective. And for example, the internal versus external rotation and the lockout overhead. Um, I like, 
Uh, and and I explained this to somebody, and you can say internal, external all day long, and people still get confused. I still get confused. Like right now, David, I have my hand over my head trying to figure out how to explain this to everybody. <laughs> but you know, you know where you you get blood drawn. Uh, that vein and the, the pit of your elbow, like right where your elbow crease is. Mm-hmm. Well, I like that to be facing the ear if possible. I don't want those pits of the elbows facing forward, right? And so that's what I mean uh, when I refer to that overhead position. So I like the, uh, I guess it's external rotation overhead then. Mm-hmm. where the inside of that elbow is facing the ear. And that's the external rotation. So I prefer that overhead because I know if I'm stacked properly and that weight's over my head, my lat is engaged and my elbow is locked, I can almost relax. And again, I'm a super heavyweight. I understand little, you know, somebody who weighs 45 kilos is not going to be able to relax with like, you know, 60 kilos over their head. But... I use that, you know, so, so take that with a grain of salt. Um, but I'm not using my arms. I'm not using, my shoulders are totally comfortable. I've never really had any shoulder problems to speak of at all. Uh, so I know how that feels versus the other way. Now, when I go to internal rotation and try to support anything, it hurts. And I know I'm not used to it. And you can get used to really anything. But as far as the economical solutions to those sorts of things. I think at the end of the day, I can, I can kind of suss it out. And I understand that some, some athletes too, they get good at a certain technique and it worked for them and they try to apply that to other athletes. Um, but I think those neutral positions to me, that overhead position where the arms are externally rotated, that's is neutral Mm -hmm. and anything outside of that. And most people are going to be somewhere in between. Um, but kind of having that whole body of experience to apply to the discussion and, and being able to concede. I mean, I'm not, a, I'm only a snob when it comes to the jerk, just because my percentage of made jerks, I think just gives me enough license to be able to say, okay, here are the fundamentals, really anything outside of this, you're doing extra other than the jerk. Uh, you know, I'm willing to concede a lot of things mm-hmm. um, and work with people and people are different. So, you know, so when I worked in Hong Kong, I often would have to explain to people why it wasn't necessarily the best process to mimic the Chinese national team because we're all different people in different situations you're, you're a guy from, uh, you know, the Netherlands, you don't, you don't look like anybody on the Chinese team. So, you know, we're going to move a little bit differently and these techniques are going to be different based on who you are and how you move and what your limitations are. I'm trying to make you the best weightlifter you can be. Right. Um, you know what I mean? So, so you're, you're gonna have to, it's a lot of troubleshooting. It's a lot of problem solving. And I think that's why I enjoy it. I think I worked with a lot of athletes who with zero training age, with zero skill, uh, inherent skill for lifting weights. But I love working with them as long as their attitude's okay and I can hang out with you for two hours in the same room. I'm going to tell you everything I know and we're going to try and figure it out together. Mm -hmm. You have to be willing to do that because if you only want to work with people who already know what they're doing, you're never going to learn anything. Um, because you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to stand there. I'm sorry. This, uh, dog just barked. <laughs> you're going to have to stand. I'm, I'm house sitting for my, uh, for my sister. So she's got three dogs. They've actually been pretty good up to this point. Uh, I'm a little surprised. How's their, that. how's their weightlifting? Uh, oh, the dogs. Yeah. <laughs> have you been coaching them? Doggy you know what? They are the laziest. They would be really great. Super heavyweight. <laughs> <laughs> All they want to do is hang out on the couch. We'll go out in the back, play ball for like five minutes. And they're like, we're over it, Auntie Cheryl. It's couch time. And I'm like, it's cool. Let's go inside. Let's go watch TV. You're instead. like, I know about uh, that but life. Anyhow, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but just but just what I'm saying is just just the problem solving and not thinking that you know everything and, and learning uh, as you go and being willing to go, Hey, I always taught it this way. And that was completely wrong. I should stop doing that. And I've had a lot of moments like that, Mm -hmm. a lot of moments like that. Um, 
so I, I think that would be my advice in, in, in athletes who were experienced and had uh, the, the good fortune to compete um, at a reasonable level. That's also going to, my favorite thing to do, one of my favorite things to do is coach somebody in a competition because I've competed so much that it's really easy for me to kind of look at somebody's demeanor. Cause I would do this with my competitors too. So we would, after weigh in, we go, we go into the warm up room, sit around the, the best thing to do, David, psychologically is to look like you don't care and to just be completely relaxed with a smile on your face. That'll mess with your competitors heads every time I guarantee it. Uh, now that I'm not competing, I feel like I could share that little secret. But what I would do <laughs> is you can you can scan the room and very quickly know who is anxious, overly anxious. Everybody's anxious, but you know who's overly anxious and you know who's not. And you know who's going to be a little bit more vulnerable. And almost always their performances sort of mirror their demeanor. So when I'm in a competition with my athlete, I, I know if they're overly worked up. You know, I can give them tips on how to relax the night before and what to think about and what to do. Go sit over here. No, don't do that. You need to sit or you need to, you know what I mean? Or you need to think about this. Stop thinking about that and, and sort of create scenarios for them that make them more relaxed and more confident uh, because I've had to do that self-talk so much. Mm -hmm. uh, so, th so that's another really good, I think, skill that somebody who was a competitive weightlifter can bring to the table and it's your advantage as a coach. Now, sure. You know, so uh, oh, yeah, I know. I, th I think that's a, I think that's a fantastic, yeah. I think it's a fantastic point. It's all about combining that, that personal experience with what you learn and using your internal logic to, like you said, fill in those gaps. Um, you know, we don't have right. too, we don't have too much more time on this broadcast, but I, I, I know I just talk so much. David. It's, it's gold. I love it. I love it. And I mean, you, you, you gave a, a great answer there. Um, but what I do want to make sure we have a little bit of time to what I have a little bit of time to ask you is um, my final question, where can people keep up with the work you're doing um, as a coach, as a broadcaster? Um, where can they hear more of you? And then this I'm referencing, I'll want you to definitely plug the USA weightlifting podcast as well as, uh, as well as your own social media outlets. Oh, well, I appreciate that, David. You're such a sweet guy. Um, well, Chad Vaughn, who was a 2004 and 2008 Olympian, teammate of mine, also a uh, David-level good, good guy, one of my favorite people in the world. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. But you can, you can actually listen to us uh, do the official USA Weightlifting podcast wherever you, you get your podcast. You can even do that on the um, you know, the little, if you, if you got an iPhone, it comes with an app that says podcast, but if you're listening to this, you probably already know how that works. Anyway, uh, <laughs> the official, I know, I just realized I'm like, you're doing this on a podcast, you idiot. Uh, so, uh, it's, it literally is called the official USA weightlifting podcast. So check us out. We do fun things like, uh, like we're just wrapping up a series, um, one through 10, each episode is an easily implemented tip that you can, and it doesn't have to do with changing program, nothing, just some quick, simple things that you can incorporate in what you already do. Um, like for example, the first couple sets, very, very light warm up without shoes on, um, pausing in certain positions during the warm up or pausing those squats, you know, so, so some really easy things you can implement if you're interested um, in that. Also, we do interviews with a lot of really cool people, um, a lot of Olympians, uh, a lot of uh, weightlifting historians and people who just know what the heck they're talking about. So if you're into weightlifting, definitely check it out. Also, you can find me um, mostly on Instagram. I do have a, a, a Facebook page, Hayworth Weightlifting. Chad makes fun of me because when I say Hayworth Weightlifting, I always go Hayworth without a Y. So it's H-A-W-O-R-T-H. Um, and you can find me on Instagram at Hayworth Weightlifting. And again, that's H-A-W-O-R-T-H Weightlifting. And, um, you know, that's pretty much it. I'm in the Atlanta area right now. And 
honestly, what I think I'm doing is uh, I'm not in the spots uh, in Atlanta that I used to be there in Buckhead. So I don't have my own permanent location right now. I kind of bounce around uh, between my athletes there. Um, I do remote programming and remote training. Uh, I go to competitions with my athletes, going to Montreal for the world championships uh, here in a couple months for the master world championships. Got a girl going there. So that's always fun and exciting. But I'm available to anybody at any time. Um, I do a lot of seminars. I also do uh, the level one and two USA weightlifting uh, sport performance certification. Um, <clears throat> and just available to, to, to help really, you know, I get, I get people listening to the podcast sometimes and going, you know, I implemented this, it worked out great, got stuck here, any further recommendation. And I'm just happy to, uh, you know, answer some of those questions for people if I can. And, uh, I don't, I don't want anybody to be struggling when it's as simple as, uh, just, just sending a quick message on, on uh, the Instagram. So, and that's pretty much it, Dave. And not doing. I'll, I'll let you know when I finally write that book, though. <laughs> if you want to workshop some, then, then if you want to workshop some, book. I, yeah, some titles, I'm available for that. <laughs> yeah, I just feel like I just feel like an awesome plug always has to do with like a book or a movie, and I have neither one of those. But, it, it, it's a book uh, or that's mo- okay. It's a book, a movie, or like a SoundCloud account for like your your new concept album or something yeah, like that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Sounds, now just follow me on Instagram. That's good enough. Yeah, Sounds of Weightlifting by Cheryl Hayworth. That'll be that'll be the concept <laughs> album in 2020. Oh my god. Oh uh, my god. That would be quite interesting actually. I mean, someone would buy it. I'm I'm telling you right now. But that's that's neither oh, here yeah, nor there. Sure. That's that's well, we can chat about that in the future for future business endeavors. <laughs> I'll be calling you immediately after this call to discuss further. <laughs> yeah, so that idea you had. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> look, Cheryl, I really appreciate you taking the time. It's always a pleasure to chat. Um, I'm you know really excited to have you as one of the first guests on the Barbin podcast, and uh, really looking forward to pushing this one live. And um, you know, hopefully, it's not the last time we do this. So many thanks for joining us, and. Uh, you know, make sure to follow Cheryl at Hayworth Weightlifting on Instagram to stay up to date with everything this legend and icon in American weightlifting is up to. So thanks for listening, folks.